you know, talk a little bit about Canada, Ukraine, the Shael, uh, and what we're reading. So should we get into it? Well, um, Canada's very close to your hometown, so you're the expert in this, aren't you? So, O oh, Canada, here we go. Oh, yeah, I got to get out of flashy flashcards. Here we go. O oh, Canada, here we go. Um, so, I, I don't know, the whole background of this is super interesting. You know, this issue of the uh, Freedom Convoy, the trucker protest has been building since January 15th, actually. And as just a backstory for our listeners, the idea was a uh, convoy of truckers were going to descend on Ottawa to demand uh, relief from vaccine mandates. Uh, what the background is like the truckers were deemed essential workers, so they had free access anywhere in the country and across the U.S. Canadian border. And Trudeau, at the start of the year, decided, "Hey, you, you have to be double vaxxed to continue your job." And there's been a lot of pushback, and uh, not only in Ottawa, but this is something that's simmering, it's spreading around the world. Uh, and now they're blocking one of the most important uh, commercial routes in uh, all the world, and uh, it's quite, quite an interesting development. And it it's, uh, feels very un-Canadian. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this may that's a good a, way to say it. It's maybe a bit of a cliche, but they're kind of a passive lot. You know, they're not they're like the sort of wild monkeys down in the United States. And no, 100 percent sort of anger going is, is unusual. <laughs> Uh, 100%. And as you mentioned, so I grew up in Detroit and my family used to have a little cottage in Ontario on Lake Erie and the Ambassador Bridge itself. I, I was trying to figure out, I've probably crossed it, you know, nearly a thousand times, you know, my whole life. Like as young as a six year old, I've been across that bridge hundreds of times. Uh, and then Detroit and Windsor are connected both, uh, you know, commercially and culturally. 25% uh, of all commerce just goes over that bridge. You're talking close to $400 million worth of goods that go back and forth. And as you know, you know, the supply chains because of the auto industry, you know, the average car has about 30,000 parts. So there's just stuff going back and forth all day and have this artery be shut down is quite amazing. And um, you're spot on. I, I was texting with one of my buddies in Canada who's right, always giving me a hard time about how crazy and wacko America is. And I thought, you know, hey, what's going on? Why? You know, why, why this, I thought only crazies lived in America in the United States. Yeah. And I guess um, Mr. Trudeau is in a jam here because he – He's going to have to break the logjam both here and actually in Ottawa. And exactly. I, I don't know in Canada they kind of have an equivalent of the National Guard or something like that. It's going to get hot and heavy, I guess, at some stage. Yeah, they're trying to – it's interesting because trucks are super hard to move, unlike, you know, say human protesters or tents or other activities. And um, – what they've done in the short term is they've, you know, literally cut off fuel supplies. They're arresting people in Ottawa. They're carrying any kind of like gas cans to, you know, refill these trucks. It's still frigidly cold up there. We're talking 25, 30 degrees at night. Um, and these truckers are living essentially in their, in the cabins of their trucks. And uh, Trudeau, as you pointed out, has said, we're not going to move. We're not going to use the military to move them. But now you get commercial pressure. You know, you got members of Congress in Michigan. You have the governor of Michigan. You have the mayor of Windsor. You have uh, important kind of commercial trade associations saying, hey, we got to get this going. And um, I don't know what the solution is. Trucks are really hard to move. Now, is there a weakness that there often is in these things in that there are lots of different protesters from different groups. They sort of have a common, common objective, but not necessarily totally. And eventually they splinter. This reminds me a little bit of the Gilets Jaunes in France, what, two or even three years ago. And for right. a few weekends, they did it every weekend, didn't they? And for a few weekends, it really looked dicey. But then, of course, they start arguing amongst themselves and they, they you know, divide and rule takes over. But this feels a bit different because of the physical, you know, the physicality of these huge, great trucks. <laughs> Now, the, the truck issue is interesting. I, I did some research on the trucking industry. Most truck companies only have two trucks, right? I mean, it's a very dispersed, it's a very kind of long tail situation, uh, you know, where you've got 80% of the trucking companies, right? But most trucks, one or two trucks, and, um, you know, it's a hodgepodge. It's interesting. The Canadian, uh, the group I was not familiar with, the Canadian Trucking Alliance, which represents truckers, uh, supposedly, uh, they're not on board with this. You know, they represent some of the big kind of proper professional, you know, world-class shipping companies, and they have got no time for this. But you're right. You've got an amalgamation of all kinds of splinter groups coming together. You're even now seeing Trump flags, which is super interesting, <laughs> in Windsor. Um, 
so yeah, what do you do? Do you wait this out? But the fact that there's a commercial impact shutting down and you're already having, uh, you know, Ford is already saying we're shutting down auto plants. Toyota's saying that. Um, it's a really horrible situation and it's going to take a commitment from Trudeau, which he probably doesn't want to do, but to really push these trucks out of the way. And there's a, there's a kind of elephant in the room, which I think is probably geography. I think a lot of what we talk about on this podcast comes down to geography, which we'll come on to when we go to Africa. But there's a big left-right split, isn't there, in Canada? The sort of um, the West Coast, BC, all that sort of mining area and lumber and, um, you know, kind of that sort of commercial area is very different politically from Ottawa and, and Toronto, I believe. Yeah, hundred percent. And to give you, um, you know, I'm prepping for, I'm going to be totally brief and uh, totally uh, disclosure for our, all our worldwide listeners. My ultimate goal is to be the U S ambassador to Canada. So I'm prepping for this job constantly. So yeah. I know a decent amount about Canada. Um, Toronto, by the way, as a G, as a GDP measurement is like 25% of all economic activity in yeah. all of Canada, right? It is like a powerhouse city, but it really drives the whole country. And you're spot on. If you go to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, they have a totally different outlook. You know, they're more closer to like Texas in the U.S. Uh, yeah. than you have. And then you, of course, get the Quebec Caw in Quebec, who, you know, every 20, 30 years seek independence. It's a really loose confederation of provinces. You've got two languages. Um, you know, if there's an independence vote in Canada, I wouldn't be surprised if three or four provinces were like, we're out of here. We've had enough. So it's a right. quite a mess that Trudeau's really stepped into. Yeah, and he's, he's um, depending on your politics, he, he's a little bit of a lightning rod, isn't he? He can be quite uh, sort of uh, um, a divisive figure. You know, he's, he's considered by many a sort of ultra-liberal, certainly the more West you go. And equally, his, you know, equally his supporters think the further West you go, the further you get from civilization. So, <laughs> Correct. And yeah, I, I know I, it's... Well, go ahead. Everybody with that comment somehow. So anybody in Canada, sorry, but that's what it looks like from the outside. And Trudeau, as you know, he just he called a snap election last fall, I think September, and uh, nothing changed. I mean, there was no literally no change in the seats. Uh, he ran an election with no outcome, no met, no decisive word from the people. Um, but this protest is really interesting because I think you know you're seeing Paris, Brussels. Um, there's stuff happening in New Zealand. You know, there's rumors floating around now that truckers are going to storm the Super Bowl in Los Angeles, which is on Sunday. Um, They'll be driving past you soon, won't they, on the way to the capital? What's well, quite interesting, which I don't think um, maybe listeners fully appreciate, it is super hard to get a truck into Washington D.C. I mean, after 9/11, this became a different kind of city and in fact there are 24 hour 24 7 guards um three blocks away from the capital and you can't drive a truck into the, I mean, if you drive a truck into the district of columbia there's like 15 government agencies watching you so it also just shows you how casual auto is that you could drive you know semis that close to the parliament i mean this uh, now could they do some stuff in the outskirts of dc 100 percent in virginia and maryland create some uh trouble for sure but could they get into the district you know i think that would be maybe a bridge to far do you see what yeah. i did there yeah very good <laughs> that's very <laughs> impressive and um well i you know i i'm no idea how this gets solved i think you know we what, have would, to, what would your advice be to Trudeau if you were talking to uh is this a canadian problem or does like what does the u.s government do i wonder if there's a get out of jail card where the americans somehow lean on canada over their vaccination policy I have heard it said that Dr. Fauci will make some, you know, um, all, all seeing, all knowing announcement about vaccinations. And that may be a way that um, Trudeau can duck it all. How true that is, I don't know. No, I think your instincts are right. Um, I was having uh, breakfast yesterday with a smart strategist here in D.C. And he's, he was – New York is very interesting because New York is obviously Manhattan, New York City, but New York goes all the way to the Canadian border. In fact, cool. Buffalo, there's, um, you know, a land bridge there across the river, and it, there's, like, physical uh, territory that touches. And um, he, you're spot on. He thought, like, once kind of the U.S. leads the way, once New York says, hey, we're kind of done with this stuff, maybe that gives Trudeau an out, and maybe this grinds out. But, you know, we're entering day five of the bridge being shut down. Um, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, I can't even remember. I mean, maybe 9-11, 
the border was shut down for a handful of days, but you know, you're talking, you know, we're entering billions of dollars with a product that's just sitting there and just in time supply chains, this gets into the whole risk strategy, you know, not having any fragility built into the system. Um, pretty wild stuff. Well, we're back to this old topic of as you get more and more efficient and you run a leaner and leaner business, the cost is you don't have resilience. You, you know, yeah. you don't have any extra capacity elsewhere. And I imagine rerouting stuff away from that bridge would be, uh, you know, a nightmare in the short term. But um, well, GM is like I read a story. I just saw a headline today. GM is like flying parts from Ontario to Michigan. Like it's like right. <laughs> completely crazy. Anyways, let's go to, um, to let me before we go off this topic. Do you think when we're back in two weeks' time, do you think we're still talking about the uh, Canadian Freedom Convoy? Um, I'll have a small bet with you and say no, but you might agree with me. I, it's, it's got a kind of, it'll get to a, it, it's, it's probably coming to a head. The fact it's on my radar yeah, towards the end of the story rather than the beginning. I mean, it's only earlier this week when you and I discussed separately about the bridge. I'd never heard of this bridge. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm in a, a tiny minority of, of people in Britain who really know where Detroit is. They probably mix it up with Chicago. Um, and given our foreign secretary, Liz Truss's <laughs> of the Ukrainian coastline, um, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be too certain she could help on this one. Well, that's a great transition. By the way, we got to get you to Detroit. You'll love it. I'll take you out. We'll have a great time. High, low meals. We'll catch some uh, Red Wings hockey. It'll be fantastic. Anyways, I'm, I'm glad this is. I'm glad this is on record. Excellent. It's on record. I'll cover all expenses. Okay, here we go. Ukraine. Great transition. Liz Truss. Let's talk about diplomacy. Macron's been over there. Liz Truss. Um, yeah, I think Boris. Boris hasn't made He's been to Brussels. He's been to uh, Poland. Um, I saw this great quote today from a Ukrainian. He said, as long as uh, the di diplomats keep showing up in Ukraine, the Russians won't visit. So I don't know. Like, we're going to have uh, diplomats going in and out of Kiev every other day to keep this thing going. Where are we with this? I quite like, and this may be a minority view, but I quite like the Russian foreign minister, Mr. Lavrov. Ah, uh, yes. There's a great profile of him today in the uh, Times, actually. You know, in a, in a world where everybody's worried about the next sound bite and whether they look good or sound right and mustn't tread on any toes, he quite happily drives a, you know, well, a big semi-truck in your language, right over, everybody's, <laughs> right over everybody's sort of sensitivities. And um, I think it's the same game we talked about two weeks ago. Uh, we're still where we are. There's more. There are more troops there now. There's now landing ships in Crimea. This is all ratcheting up to some sort of, I sense some sort of deal. And Macron's come up with this idea of Ukraine being... Um, a neutral power, a bit like Finland. That made right. a way for both sides to step down. Whether that's particularly good for Ukraine, I don't know. And one thing we forgot to mention, or I forgot to mention last time, is, of course, Ukraine, um, after 1989, gave up nuclear weapons. Yep. And I bet they which, which Lavrov was a part of, actually, getting back to the foreign minister. I bet, yeah, I bet he was. And, of course, uh, the Americans lent on the Ukrainians, saying, look, you know, this, this, is, this has got to go. There are too many nuclear weapons. Let's knock those on the head. Don't worry. We'll always be there. Well, hmm. <laughs> Getting back to Lavrov, yeah, there's a great profile today in the uh, Times. Maybe we'll put that in the show notes. Um, yeah, the guy's 71 years old. He's still out there. He's still hustling. He spent 10 years in New York. In fact, his daughter uh, was born in New York and still lives in Manhattan, which I found pretty interesting. So I'm not sure. I, I'm trying to figure out if she, I don't know, maybe she's got U.S. citizenship. Um, pretty interesting. So, yeah, that guy, I, you know, what's interesting, and this is actually the book I'm going to talk about at the end, um, the U.S., you know, we've only really been doing diplomacy for i want to say 70 years to be totally honest you know i mean yeah. i guess you could say benjamin franklin was doing some stuff um you know he famously i don't know if you know about this he went to canada at the start of the revolutionary war in 1775 i guess and said hey canada come with us um anyways our level of diplomacy is nowhere near i mean the russians have been doing diplomacy for a thousand years and i just feel lavrov is just really really good at his job whether you agree with him or not he's yeah. been doing it for a long time um he's a towering figure um he's a charmer and a bruiser at the same time yeah and i think the other thing is he and more importantly mr putin don't have a public audience that they have to keep 
totally on side all the time. And in fact, the more they rattle sabers, the more it distracts the Russian population from other problems. And it's probably quite a popular move. I mean, the, yeah. move, to, the move into Crimea was definitely popular. 100%. And it was, uh, you know, strategically it made sense. Like he had to have Crimea. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting is an aside, um, speaking to another strategist here in Washington, D.C., who's well plugged into the Democrat National Party, um, he is adamant that the U.S. do something like to uh, eliminate Putin for two reasons. A, he thinks Putin is like creating all kinds of like uh, generating internal strife here in the U.S. with kind of propaganda and misinformation campaigns and also just pay back for, uh, you know, 2020 uh, with tr- or 2016. I'm sorry, with Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton. Um which is really interesting. I mean, um, it's in, when you're in power, when your team's in power, you tend to be a bit more uh, bullish and uh, being aggressive. But that was a, I hadn't heard that before. There's like there's like vitriol against Putin. It's, like a, it's almost personal now. The, don't the Democrats have a habit of getting entangled in lots of, uh, uh, well, you know, foreign ventures, so to speak? Sure, but he was right to push back. You know, he reminded me of, uh, you know, the neocons and uh, Team Bush in uh, the Middle East. So, I don't know. There's probably no uh, perfect American administration. Well, let's let's hope that he goes out of it a bit. I think there'll be some sort of sort of deal, but I, I sense... You know, we've got a few more weeks to go. I'm always nervous to say this because probably by the time we finish this podcast, somebody's fired a shot or something. But I, as you said, nothing before the end of the Olympic Games. Uh, you said that last time. And I think in a fortnight's time, we could probably report, you know, repeat our little story at the moment. And we should all become more, your Finland observation is spot on. You know, we should all be learning more about the Winter War, right? And becoming uh, experts yeah, in uh, the Finland. Right. Finland. Yeah, no, that was a very interesting war where they, they kind of changed sides two or three times. But um, we're supposed to be looking forward, not worrying about what's been going on. What's your sense around the, um, you know, as a communications professional, I'm, I'm interested in just the amount of material, the amount of leaks, the special, the exclusives that, uh, you know, American reporters and, you know, Western reporters and London have been getting. What's your sense about, just from a comms perspective, how London, Brussels, NATO, and D.C. have handled this? Well, I think we can forget Brussels. Um, NATO, I think, <laughs> of, NATO uh, followed um, pretty much the line of London and Washington. And I think we remarked last time that the, the level of... of um, you know, the information war is much higher from the US and the UK and I guess France um, than really in the past because we we associate Putin with, you know, cyber attacks, um, misinformation, uh, compromising information, all this kind of stuff. And he hasn't quite got it together. But um, one last factor to think about is some of the satellite countries around Russia are nervous about this. You know, there's yeah, been, yeah. been trouble in Kazakhstan and uh, some of the other stands, I think, look slightly nervously at Moscow now. So I think he may get very genteel pressure. Why don't we just kind of, you know, call it a day for now and just get, get some pressure in. And maybe, maybe another card which we talk about, let him rejoin G8. I think that would be difficult to do, uh, particularly, you know, where he is now. But maybe in a three or five year view, they get back on the table. Now, yeah, there's definitely uh, the human psychology of just making Putin feel special, inviting some uh, high level conferences, get him at the table is spot on. Speaking of table, can we talk about the ginormous table between the Macron and Putin Perfect. And some of the, uh, I want to get your thoughts on that, Macron's diplomacy, and also this idea that Macron refused to take a COVID, a Russian COVID test, because he didn't want his DNA to end up in some Moscow lab, demanded that there be a ginormous table. I mean, this is like absolutely fantastic. Any thoughts on that? Perhaps they could clone him with the DNA. (laughs) So we wouldn't know who is the correct Mr. Macron. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, let's, annoy at least 25% of the audience again. We're talking about short men with a very large table. And I, I, I was quite jealous. I just, I do have the same office. So I was, I was kind of impressed that, you know, my I, office I, is very similar to Putin. Yeah, I imagine all the decorations uh, come from the same firm that did Saddam Hussein and the Trump Tower. Um, it, looks like, 
it looks like late Saddam Hussein to me, mid midterm Trump. Um, yeah, just awful. And decidedly uh, not an IKEA setup for sure. No, the opposite of IKEA. Well, you need a lot of guys from screwdrivers to put that table together. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a, for a domestic audience uh, on Russian national television. You know, our lad, Mr. Putin, he's telling this little Frenchman what's what, and we're keeping them at arm's length and all this. So at one level, it's sort of a bit comic. Well, it's comic at all levels, really, but I don't know why people indulge in this, but it's a human thing, I suppose. The memes from it have been absolutely fantastic. So uh, if anything, this Ukrainian crisis has brought us some good comedy, some good levity. So, hey, let's pivot to. I'm been fascinated with this. I don't know if you care about this, but this the Bitnef Bit Phoenix hack, yeah, and the arrest of this couple in Manhattan. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. Um, apparently, the DOJ has not released who the hack has been committed by, but they are suggesting that this couple in Manhattan has laundered what has now grown to 3.6 billion dollars. Initially, they were given 120,000 bitcoins in 2016 by the hacker. We don't know who that is, and it was initially 77 million dollars. It's grown to now nearly four billion dollars, and they've been trying to launder that. I mean, you're a financial expert. I have no idea how to launder money, let alone four billion dollars. Um, I have a lot of questions. Any thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you know you paid my invoice. I could tell you how to launder money. <laughs> um, the key thing about laundering money is you have to break the chain. Yeah. So take a really old example of this in the 1970s. You would have gone into um, this will upset another group of people, but you had gone into a private bank in Geneva or Zurich, and you would have bought a bearer bond. So whoever holds it owns it. It's not registered in any name. You walk across the street and you sell it to a, to a different bank. Yeah. And it's done. And you're off and running. Bearer bonds kind of gone. You know, nobody, nobody will touch them, a lot of regulation against them and all the rest of it. Now, what I think people thought, and I would say I, I thought that with Bitcoin, was it, it was anonymous. But, of course, it's got a, it's got a trail behind it. Yeah. So, Kind of as a ledger, a ledger, yeah. yeah it's a ledger. And, you know, I'm, I'm always nervous when people say things can't be broken into because we go all the way back to Julius Caesar uh, who thought he had an unbreakable code, and it wasn't. And, uh, you know, we obviously in recent history were kind of gripped with all the, the, the cryptography of, of the Second World War, but there's a, there's a more recent story was um, the CIA set up a company called Crypto AG <laughs> in, uh, in, in Switzerland. And they sold what was supposed to be very independent, high-end cryptography to all the Arab states, to Gaddafi, Saddam, and all the rest of it. And, of course, they just had to press a button and they saw all the information. So <laughs> you know, the idea that you are super secure, you know, beyond super secure, I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping to get hold of a a quantum expert on this show, maybe in the summertime, who can explain to us about and um, everybody about quantum computing, because I think the speed of these computers will, will start to break um, things like blockchain. And you know, it's all going to be very, very, so yeah, no. laundering, these guys have been slightly naive. It's a little bit like <laughs> you, you steal the Mona Lisa. You can't actually sell the damn thing. Yeah. Where would you go with it? Yeah. yeah. Now, I have so many questions, you know, are they patsies? Are they, you know, why is the arrest happening now? You know, and the, I read the statement of facts that the DOJ put out and um, the Russian was in there nine times, which I don't think was uh, not intentional. Um, I have so many questions, you know, like, why didn't they run? Like, if you had that much cash, why would you stay in Manhattan? You know, why didn't you get it into the normal, uh, you know, they're buying gift cards at Walmart. And it's also interesting to your point, Bitfinex from the start has been working with the U S government and other agencies, you know, other governments or other uh, corporations that obviously working with the DOJ as well to make their data available. And, um, once they crack the code, there are actually people, as you say, like they're running around saying, this is why Bitcoin's so great. There's actually a trail. You can actually, you know, prevent crime from happening. Very interesting development. I think we missed out one of our favorite people in all of this, of course, which is um, the president of North Korea, 
Um, and in fact, <laughs> yeah. there were some news stories this week that North Korea have been harvesting bitcoins and turning them into uh, into greenbacks and then yep. turning them into missiles. Right. And you you have to feel that it's those type of bad actors, to use the phrase, that could be involved. I wouldn't put it past beyond um, the government of Iran. Um, all sorts of people could well be involved in these sort of papers. Uh, no, so you got to think, right, the DOJ, and they get, apparently it's easier to prove money laundering and violating bank secrecy laws than it is to prove a hack. So uh, it was interesting yeah. that the DOJ did not say who the hack was. And so is it a foreign, is it a government, were, were they the hackers? Um, and then how do you even get involved? You know, I don't know. Like, where do you, is there a LinkedIn profile for, you know, hey, I've, I've got all these Bitcoins. Can you help me launder them? Yeah, I was going to say, are you thinking of starting a money laundering group? Well, if I, if I would do it, if I wouldn't get caught, you know, and also if I, I, you know, at the same breakfast yesterday, I was like, if I had this much money, I would not stay in Manhattan. I would, I don't know. I just was like, I don't understand. That's a lot of money. $4 well, billion. Dollars. I don't know. What, I don't know what your exit number is, but mine is not $4 billion. No, I mean, it's very briefly a story I'm reminded from the 1970s, maybe 1980s in Australia of a guy who was an unemployed printer uh, uh, who started printing Aussie dollars. This is when they were still in paper, <laughs> still in paper and, and not in plastic. And he thought he'd just do ten or 20,000. But in a great quote, he said, well, I had the paper, so I just ran it through the machine. And he, he did about 5 million Aussie, which was kind of a serious amount of money 30, 40 years ago. So it's quite nice money now. Anyhow, then he found... Um, I think he actually gave himself in because he got tired of the whole process because he had to take all these <laughs> and stick them in the bath with mud and walk up and down with boots on and all the rest of it. And then he found he couldn't actually spend it. You know, you can't go in, even in those days, it's quite, you, 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 you're going to spend money in cash. You know, you've got a US, you know, a couple of million US in cash. I suppose you could get into drugs and things, but in those days, he bought himself a car. And he couldn't buy a house because it was, you know, too difficult. People thought it was suspicious if you turn up. Right. A turn up a million dollars and buy a house, right. In a funny sort of way, these things are slightly self-limiting. There's only so many yachts you can have, I guess. Now, there's a great movie, which I hope you've seen, Richard Pryor, Brewster's Millions, where he inherits money, but he's got to spend, I think, $30 million in 30 days. And it's not yeah, easy. No, I recall it. I recall it. Very good. And speaking of Bitcoins, is actually, there's a great story in um, – CNBC, there's a headline, you know, Bitcoin donations are pouring into the Ukraine as Russian troops mass on the border. So, you know, now people are using Bitcoins to fund revolutionary movements and uh, governments around the world. What a week. It always, it always comes back to dollars because I yeah. can't take my Bitcoin down to the local supermarket. So, not yet. Not yet, anyways. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm deeply skeptical of all these um, cryptocurrencies. Um, I just think, in fact, they're a problem, but nothing of the problem of NFTs. Um, I'm still expecting you to issue your first NFT. Actually. Um, yeah, I'm, um, in the, I'm in negotiations right now. I'm just trying to sort out, you know, the best platform and, you know, the best artistry. And yeah. You need to mention Rye one more time, just in case they do listen in. To the <laughs> actually, yeah, that's a good we, I wonder the transcription service. I mean, assume that every time we say RAI, uh, that, um, yeah. We must get picked up somewhere in Rome, so we should keep saying it. Maybe we propose to them a joint NFT situation. Yeah, you, you, you're happy to fly from Detroit, where you're going to leave me. Go to Rome. Lovely. <laughs> hey, speaking of developing issue, let's talk about the Sue Hell. Yeah, I, I pronounce it Sue Hell. How do you pronounce it? Wrongly, probably. I'm going to say Sahil. Ah, I've heard, actually, I've heard it pronounced both ways, so. Yeah, in fact, I misspelled it when I started looking into it properly. I thought it was two E's, but it's one. It's an Arabic word for the coast. And um, very quick snapshot of what part of the world we're talking about. We're talking about a band of land which is south of the Sahara, but north of the African rainforest. Right. It's that first bit of land, if you came down from the Mediterranean coast, that was properly habitable and um, you could do things with. Um, quick uh, weather um, comment here. In fact, the, until 5,000 years ago, the Sahara wasn't that dry. 
it was habitable. But over the last five years, uh, 5,000 years, it's, um, it's gone to obviously a load of sand. And in fact, the Sahara is a part of the world which seems to be on some cycle of going between wet and dry. But we're in the dry uh, part now. And the Sahel has been mainly occupied by nomadic tribes who have jealously guarded the trade routes across the Sahara, which is extremely difficult to get to. And, you know, it was a sort of dead part of the world. I mean, I, if you can visualize, or I guess we'll put a map up, it's sort yeah. of, it kind of runs from Mauritania uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, right right the way over to, I guess, it's Eritrea and uh, that part of the world. Yeah, I think we're talking like six to eight nations, right? I mean, yeah, and it's over it's, a million square miles, the vast territory. Yeah, and, and loads of countries you've vaguely heard of in geography and instantly forgotten about, like Niger and Chad and Mauritania, all these sort of places. But um, as is often the way with these places that are politically unstable because of the sort of still the tribal nature of things, it um, compounded by European powers in the 1880s drawing lines on maps and calling them countries, um, you know, it's a worse version of the Middle East for that. It's politically not very stable. And then, again, so what? Well, let's add in, um, you know, a really frightening component, uranium. It turns out Niger, uh, that Niger is the um, fourth or even third largest producer of u uranium in the world. And um, you've got a lot of political in uh, instability, uh, two or three different big Islamicist terrorist groups uh, yeah. and, and the more local sort of religious tribes. Um, this is a big worry. And more than a big worry, um, a lot of this used to be in the French colonial empire. Correct. This, this has landed on Monsieur's probably slightly smaller desk than Mr. Putin's. And <laughs> the French sort of, they're not being quiet about it, but it doesn't get reported very much. They've had five, six, seven thousand troops there for the last twenty years, really just trying to keep a lid on things. And I, the reason for talking about it now, um, which I know you know quite a bit about, there've been one or two coups in that area, and you know, is the lid starting to come off the top of it, basically? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, I, I didn't know anything about this region, surprisingly, not surprising as American, you know, I only pay attention to what's happening in, uh, I don't know, Hollywood and uh, the New York Post. Well, but, you know, um, you know Canada. Well, Canada, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I know two things. So, um, but I, there's a great series from Canal, the Bureau or Les Bureaux des Légions. You like that? Six years of French training. Great TV show about the French DGSE, the spy agency. Yeah. They actually do three episodes about this region and all these issues to talk about Islamic terrorists, Al Qaeda, but also the immigration, um, that the migration patterns from, you know, sub saharan Africa up to Libya and then obviously into Europe. Um, really interesting region and a lot of activity has been there. Not only uh, U.S. or not only French and German, but even the U.S. has been there. Lost a few troops during the uh, Trump administration. Um, but it's like a percolating situation. There have been three coups now, as you say, in eight months. Um, and the Russians, hello, once again, the Russian, the Wagner group, which is a mercenary group, has been showing more and more attention. In fact, the locals have been seemingly anti-French, pro-Russian. And um, this is like a simmering issue for sure. This is, a, this is a new name to me until I looked this up ahead of the show. Um, I, I think we should call it the Wagner group. It sounds much more... <laughs> <laughs> chariots of fire type stuff um but they're a, they're one of these sort of odd outfits we have two or three of these sort of in the uh, in the uk you probably do well you definitely do in in the states where you get people who may have spun out of special forces or they've spun out of the secret service and they sort of set up slightly shadowy consulting businesses so right. the sort of half in the commercial world and but they're always happy to supply quote security unquote now the russian one seems to be just security but if you uh, there's a wikipedia page on on uh, wagner wagner whatever um they're all over the place yeah uh, if there's trouble they seem to be there and there's a definite feeling that this is 
almost like a sort of foreign legion for Putin. No, and I think you're uh, getting back to Putin. This kind of plays into his strategy. I mean, you know, he's creating havoc in Ukraine. He's doing training in Belarus. You know, he's like getting the uh, the Swedish to move troops to islands in the Baltic. Uh, you know, he's he's active in Africa. He's just like picking. He's just creating problems every day. And I once think- again, like this distracts Macron. You know, he's going to be worried about two fronts, so to speak. Sure, and we shouldn't forget the Chinese in all of this. The Chinese have a a slightly different, um, or Chinese government, or should I even say Chinese Communist Party, have a slightly different angle in that they sort of use the mafia tactic. Uh, You you lend money to people who can't repay it, and um, suddenly they seize the asset. And there's been a lot of um, examples of that. Um, I don't know if I can find a map and send it through and we'll put it in the show notes, but there's a lovely map of Chinese involvement in Europe, in all the ports. They've got a whole string of ports. We've got a string of ports in Africa and um, Pakistan and all over. And, of course, they've they've typically done ports and railways. Um, So how, how that deal pans out with Russian military stuff, I don't know. But, you know, we, are we back in the 1880s where great powers are now, you know, fighting it out o- over Africa again? Well, there's a great book. Um, it was written, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago called, it was like the Pentagon's new map and this idea of the core versus the gap, you know, core countries kind of being, you know, North America, Western Europe, um, Japan, and then gap countries would be, yeah, sub-Saharan Africa, mm-hmm. um, the Middle East. And, um, you know, listen, there's a reason why the Shihao has been a problem for a thousand years. I mean, it's at this crossroads. Same with Ukraine, getting back to geography. I mean, it's like where it is on the map. Invariably, it's always going to have these kind of friction points, unfortunately, but that's kind of the reality of the situation. Yeah, I think that uh, this also plays into the current European and British um, energy crisis. Uh, Macron has just announced a very dramatic increase in investment in nuclear power. This will upset the Greens in Germany big time. But, you know, there is going to be a shift towards um, uh, more nuclear. I think it will come in Britain eventually, um, probably very slowly. Um, But, of course, we need uranium. Now, there is uranium in Australia and there is in Canada, but um, it would be nice to be able to use other uranium. And maybe more importantly, we do not want, or the West do not want terrorist groups controlling you a uranium mine. I mean, that's, Correct. you know, big, big problems ahead. So it's it's one for people to sort of keep in the back of their mind, but it wouldn't take a great deal for it to flare up. I think it was interesting, and I'm always a bit of a contrarian on this because, you know, I'm like, if these ports were such good investments or if these mines were such good investments, there's certainly somebody in the West would figure out how to make it work. So the fact that, you know, Russia and China are taking over these second and third tier properties, I don't know. Does it matter? I mean, it sounds scary. It sounds it may be unsettling, but. It may be more integrated that you do do the ports and the railways and you've got the mine there. And also they're the customer. So this is, this is kind of like vendor financing a little bit. You know, yeah. I, need, I need all this copper. So I'll build you the railway and I'll build you the port and everything. You give me the copper. Oh, by the way, we, we need more copper or we need more cash. Oh, you can't do it. We'll take it all over. So I think, that in a way, it's a form of vertical integration for the Chinese. And yeah. And, oh, and, oh, by the way, we need your vote at the UN, you know, when uh, we try to do something silly in the South China Sea. And, and does the president's brother-in-law need a new uh, jet? I don't mean in the US. I mean in the African country. You know, they're never short of rather nice um, aircraft in Africa. Well, you know, somebody's got to uh, support the uh, the Boeing industry of the world and, you know, all those uh, fancy hotels in the uh, south of France. So Lovely. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it is interesting when we care about money laundering and stuff getting floated around, you know. It's a problem until it's a real problem, if you know what I mean, you know. I mean. Yeah, I think I – think- uh, everything to do with money is never actually about money. It's always about time, time and timing. You know, the um, uh, the old phrase of when you go bankrupt, it happens in two stages, very slowly and then very suddenly. <laughs> it's always about time. And I think um, this is 
this is true about money laundering and, and unusual ways of moving money around. It's sort of accepted and doesn't become a problem until you get to the sort of situation I had in South America where you have um, Medellin cartel and all these narco armies and all the rest of it. They basically could pay off the country's debt in Colombia. I mean, yeah, which is the situation. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so, hey, speaking of timing, we're coming to the end of our show. Let's go to our favorite segment, reading and watching. What are we reading? What are we watching? Uh, well, I'm still or listening I'm still to. On, I'm still on the book from two weeks ago. I'm about 300 pages to go. But here's a recommendation. <clears throat> are you enjoying it? Are you enjoying the Silk Road? Is yeah, it good? No, it's very, very good. But I've got a recommendation for this time. Um, and again, we'll probably put a link in the show notes. But it's, yeah. it's called Why Most Things Fail. Evolution, Extinction, and Economics. It's by a very interesting writer called Paul Ormerod. He's a, he's a heavy-hitting academic, but he's got, uh, you know, he's got his uh, head in the commercial world as well. And um, it's an easy read, and it's the fact that most things sort of have a natural life to them, whether it's businesses, um, products, whatever, and why that is actually a good thing. I mean, very few companies last 100 years. Some these days only last 10 or 20 years. And um, I, th I think people would enjoy that. So that, that's my book. And um, I'm going to just plug an old film, um, which is called The Train. And it stars Burt Lancaster. It's in black and white. It was done in 1964. It's kind of a, a sort of resistance against a Nazis type film about... Love it. Trying to save stolen artwork. But it is stunningly filmed in black and white. I would love to see it in a, in a large cinema screen. So get people to look up the train. I think they, they really enjoy it. No, that sounds great. I've been watching a lot of, um, I don't know, Nazi. I saw this Nazi kind of World War II films recently, and there's this new term, dad television, right, where they're targeting, you know, 45 to 55-year-olds with all this, like, dad television so i fell into it anyways the book i'm reading i've dug back into raven rock written by garrett graff it's got a great subtitle so raven rock the story of the u.s government's secret plan to save itself while the rest of us die it's all about the introduction of the nuclear missile and what it meant to not only the presidency but also u.s foreign policy and what would happen in the event of attack how the government the u.s government would reconstitute itself and try to keep going and um as Garrett points out in the book, the president may die, but the presidency will not die, right? And there's like plans to keep this thing going. Um, kind of interesting with what we're talking about in the world it's, it's to get a reminder of. Uh, no, it's it's a it's a factual sort of idea. yeah, it's a, a secret yeah documents like going back to like the '60s released um, you know the plan to you know crazy ideas where. Um, say Detroit was bombs, um, you know, you got 30 minutes to kind of decide to get out, you leave. Um, you know, the plan was everybody who lived would find their way to a national park and fill out a, a postcard and the, you would mail it in <laughs> to a central repository and say, Hey, I'm alive. And um, I don't know, interesting stuff like that. And um, staffers, me, go ahead. Yeah. It reminds me of the documentary I watched a few years ago about the day of 9 11. And yeah, how Bush, Bush ended up in Nebraska. Um, no, exactly. So, and then Raven Rock is actually um, a legit uh, military base, or uh, uh, sixty miles outside of DC. And it's like an underground bunker, and um, there's speculation that's where Cheney went on 9/11 as well when he came back to the White House. So, no, really interesting, but um, it's just a great reminder too. Getting back to foreign policy, like nobody really cared where the vice president up until. True, up until the nuclear bomb, like the, the vice president literally could vanish for like two or three weeks and like it yeah. didn't even matter. And now, uh, you know, when you've got 15 minutes to kind of decide what kind of hellfire you want to return, um, you know, it changes the way you govern a country uh, and how you're going to survive. And, you know, just fantastic stories like staffers, like if you were for the White House, if you were one of the people to get picked, you would get saved, you know, supposedly, but you'd have to leave your, you know, wife and child back at home or, you know, your assistant would get picked, but your wife wouldn't get picked. Kind of crazy stuff like that. So it probably, um, probably depends on your government service grade as to whether you, you get out or not. 
Now there's a great, yeah. And this is a total aside. There's a great story. Um, there's a great show, the West wing and uh, Dee Dee Myers was the press secretary and she was advising Aaron Sorkin on the show and Sorkin had written into the script about these secret cards. Yeah. And Dee Dee Myers like, that doesn't exist. That's a total fabrication, but she didn't have one of the cards. George Stephanopoulos who was a higher ranked, <laughs> had the card. So you were spot on. Oh dear. So you've got to, it's like everything. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Exactly. So Anyways, a good wrap up. Fun to do this, Gerald. We'll be back in uh, two weeks' time Indeed. with um, hopefully new stories. Yeah, and new we may have a guest. We we do plan to have guests, and we hope to um, wheel somebody on for the one in two weeks' time. So watch this space. Watch this space. I love it. All right, buddy. Have a good weekend. Have okay. some good meals. Relax. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.